This video is entitled Personal, Legal, Ethical, and Organizational Issues and goes along with Chapter 4 of BUIS 2100, our Introduction to Information Systems. I'm Dr. Renault from Shawnee State University and I'll be taking you through this video lecture. Privacy. It is a huge issue and problem in modern society, in, in my opinion. You know, currently there are a, a group of federal laws that, that regulate parts of, of privacy and information systems. The big ones are HIPAA, H-I-P-A-A, -A, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. That, that requires doctors to, to, and hospitals and medical providers to, to protect certain medical information and personally identifiable medical information. You always see that HIPAA um, paperwork and certificate you get in the mail and, and uh, you have to fill out the HIPAA paperwork every time you go to the doctor. Um, it basically says only certain people are allowed to see certain things in your medical records. The uh, Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act deals with your bank transactions and credit card transactions to make sure that they're accurate and you can assess them, that your banks don't have private information about you that you don't have. The uh, Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act protects children under the age of 13 from certain things and children under the age of 18 from other things. But um, really, it's, it's a patchwork of regulations. How much information is out there about you? Huge amounts. Absolutely huge amounts. Think about all that Facebook and Twitter and Google and Apple and Microsoft and Discord and, and all of the other Instagram and all of the other uh, TikTok and all of the other applications you use know about what you like, what you watch, what you spend your time with, um, what you shop, Amazon, eBay. Um, they can tell huge amounts about you. And then what do they do with that information? Well, have you ever read the terms of service? that you agree to when you sign up for those free accounts? Have you ever read the company's privacy policy? There's a link on the bottom of the page. You ever gone into the detailed settings and actually look at what's shared to everybody, future employers, all kinds of people that can go in and look at, at what's out there about you online. So do you have privacy? when you're using those kinds of services? I don't think the answer is yes. Um, and it's really up to you to protect and guard your privacy and only tell what really is necessary out there. Only leave the information that's really necessary out there. Now, if we were in Europe, and we were EU citizens or in an EU uh, treaty country, there is something known as the GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation. It's a much more holistic privacy uh, protection system, uh, privacy regulations, than all the European countries. And if you do business in Europe, or even have European customers or European individuals looking at your accounts or systems, you really need to be uh, apply uh, the, the GDPR regulations. Um, the GDPR protects genetic information, race and ethnic information, and the information dealing with religious beliefs. Um, it, it's, it has a whole bunch of parts, and the parts are that a user must consent to their data being collected. You must ask them very specifically, can we collect this data? This is the data we're going to be collecting. And how many times do you go to a website the first time and you get a little pop-up saying, we use cookies and we're going to track the following. Do you read it? Probably not. You just say, okay. Any of the data that is shared is anonymized in such a way that it can't be directly attributed to a single individual. 
Maybe it's a group by postal region or country or city or that kind of stuff. Um, the GDPR requires you to be notified of a breach if there is a breach of, of the security of the system. You have to, the GDPR requires that if you're transferring data from one entity to another, it has to be done safely or encrypted. And every business, every entity online must have a GDPR officer or some individual person responsible for GDPR actions. You know, the, the, the great way that, uh, that it, what it does is it creates confidence, it creates maybe some better security, and it did that by forcing companies to really address security from start to finish in their online business, updating old software and systems and, and writing current systems that really do things right. So that's why I put that little note there, keep them current, because if your systems are current, your chance of breach is maybe a little reduced. Email. Is email private or secure? The answer is, it was created back in the early days. The email systems we use today were created, or many of the email systems we use today were created in the really early days of the internet, um, back when it was just the military and, and academic and research facilities. And, and it wasn't that important, but email can be stored and sent as plain text, which means that you could actually see the text as it's flying across the internet. Now, most clients are now encrypting internet or encrypting email as it's sent, but it's still not secure. Remember that corporate and school email is not private. Administrators at your corporation or your school can read the details of all of your emails sent from a corporate or student account. So <laughs> don't be sending passwords or medical information or other uh, personally identifiable information that you don't want your employer or school to see. Remember also that free email ain't free. Um, Google sees the text of all of your emails, keeps it in a server, analyzes it, studies it, uses it to target advertising towards you um, so that free email account really isn't that free. Remember, they also know who you're sending email to, how big the emails are, how many attachments. Um, then they can even see the at attachments. Now, there are some email services that are end-to-end -end encrypted, and that's kind of what that E2E encrypted is all about. And if you want your emails to be HIPAA compliant or generally secure. Now, it requires users on both ends to have the same encrypted email service. Google Professional uh, does some end-to-end -end encryption. There's a, there's a pay service called Proton uh, that, that you can uh, um, use for end-to-end -end data encryption and email encryption. I personally use Proton and several of my clients use Proton just because um, the, the servers are based in Europe, covered under the GDPR, and uh, it's, a, it's a really nice system for end-to-end -end email encryption. But do I send financial transactions? Do I, do I do a lot of that kind of stuff via email? No, I don't, and I, and I don't recommend that you do either. What data is collected when you're poking around on the web or you're browsing the web? Let me just say there's a lot of it. Um, first thing, just about every server creates and all websites you go to and everywhere you go creates log files of activity. So your IP address, the date and time you're there, the pages you look at, the amount of time you spend on the pages, every click, um, are all recorded on that server and can, of course, be 
subpoenaed, um, uh, requested by authorities, and and used to analyze who you are. Because if, if one organization knows that this IP address belongs to this email address, and all of a sudden this same IP address is being is over here on this other server, if those ever get connected, they know it's you, don't they? So an IP address is somewhat anonymous, but your IP address will often, even at home, if it's dynamically allocated by your IP provider, by your internet provider, it's often static for a significant period of time. In other words, it doesn't change. There are also things called cookies. And cookies are small data packets that web servers send down and store in your web browser. And then when your web browser goes back to those uh, sites again, it sends the cookie back. Usually the cookie is a random number, a string of unidentifiable information, um, just an encryption key or something, but it, it doesn't usually contain any significant data, but it, it includes a unique marker that goes with you. So if you have your laptop, you've got cookies on your laptop, your laptop goes to different IP addresses, ah, but the same cookie goes up so they know it's you regardless of what IP address you're on. Oh, so now they can associate a cookie to an IP address. So again, there they go, hooking looking and understanding who you are and where you go and what you do. Cookies can be used very benignly um, for customization. Um, you know, it can be used to customize the colors or to remember your name or your user account or to, or to do some of that kind of stuff. And, and they're, they're nice that way. But cookies can also be used to track usage across multiple websites. There's uh, there's a Google service that uses a Google tracking cookie, and uh, Google tracks you across multiple web server web accounts and knows where you go. Um, many sites won't work without them. You know, many sites uh, limit what you can do without cookies and without sharing that without storing that information and sending back to them and being part of their tracking or customization systems. There are programs called cookie managers that you can load into your web browsers and actually look at the cookies and look at how the cookies are being sent and, and what's being sent and where they're sent to. Kind of fun to watch. Um, and also kind of eye-opening and scary. So we've talked about privacy and we've talked about data that's being collected and we've talked about some of the laws. But now let's let's look at, at this ethical issue. Um, and the ethical issue I want to talk about right now is the digital divide. And the, uh, the, the digital divide is the difference between wealthy versus poor in their computer author ownership, broadband access and speed, and general computer literacy. As government and other entities move more and more to online, online business, you, if you want to update your health insurance, you have to go online. If you want to, to do certain things with federal, state, and local government, you have to do it online. But what if you live in an area of the state, of the country, of the world that doesn't have high-speed internet? What if you come from a family living at poverty or less, uh, or, or even at uh, multiple times of poverty with lots of bills, and you don't have a decent computer. You don't have a modern web browser. Maybe you've got an old Windows XP box you're still using. Well, it's not going to work on a lot of websites. And so the poor, the the underprivileged and a large part of the world who live in, in poorer countries are really out of luck. Um, and how ethical and moral is that for a company to require you or a government to require you to use those services if those services aren't provided to you? Yeah, that, that's tough. 
You know, a question that, that I want to ask most of you or all of you is how fast is your internet connection on campus? Well, it's probably really fast because you're on campus. How fast is your internet connection at home? You know, in, in the city, most of us have decent connections. Some of us out in rural uh, Appalachia and rural America have decent high-speed connections, but there are still large portions of rural America um, that, that don't have access to high-speed internet. Best you're going to get is 4G on your phone if you climb up to the top of a mountain, maybe. Um, so how much, for instance, an online class, how able are you to do that if you don't have the technology or the, uh, the, the bandwidth? I went and looked up the cost of bandwidth around the world, and there's a, a website called numbo, N-U-M-B-E-O dot com, that has statistics about the cost of living in countries all over the world. And one of the things they did was they ranked the 108 countries that they study um, in order by the cost of a, the monthly cost of a 60 plus megabyte ADSL or cable internet connection. 60 meg is, you know, it's not screaming, but it's, it's enough to get things done for, for most of us and most households. In Ethiopia, this is 2020 numbers, in Ethiopia, a 60 meg ADSL or cable connection costs almost $400 a month. In the UAE, the uh, uh, Arab Emirates, an internet connection costs $98 a month. In uh, the U.S., the average cost is 66 That makes us the 10th most expensive country in the world for internet services on average for a decent high-speed connection. Canada's just right behind us at 62 bucks. Sweden um, is at $33. In India, the average price for a high-speed internet connection is $10. Now, is it available in rural India? Is it available for farmers in India? Is it available to in, in a lot of India? I, I don't know the statistics exactly. I, I don't know the availability, but still. And then Ukraine is the cheapest country in the world for uh, less than $6. Actually, it's $5 and, and, and 80 or 90 cents. I don't remember the exact number. But um, why is that the case? Well, um, Ukraine, um, uh, it was all built by, by Russia when, when the, when in the early days and in, in the last days of, of the Soviet Union, and they just have the, the digital infrastructure that, that a lot of, of countries don't have. But isn't that interesting that we're the 10th most expensive country out of the 108 surveyed on this website, um, and if you're working for minimum wage, it's really hard to spend a day's wage, a day, a month's wage on your internet connection, especially when you have to have a telephone, car, and all the other things you have to have. So the digital divide is real, and we need to pay attention to it. And you need to not forget that not everybody has the same connection you do. I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, information technologies and the workplace. IT is changing the, the workplace around the world and changing the way we all do business. You know, IT is reducing purchasing costs. There's uh, telecommunication and, and telecommuting. There's uh, a whole process of of, of an idea that we, we think of called job de-skilling, where we don't have to teach somebody how to do a job to the detail we used to because the systems handle it for them. So maybe we don't have to have skilled labor. We can use unskilled labor and pay them less because the systems are doing certain things for us. And then the idea of virtual organizations, which are made up of lots of little groups or little organizations that 
share skills and markets to to have the ability to do things that larger organizations have that that our larger organizations can do that smaller organizations can't it's really going to change the work workplace and continue to change the workplace for your entire professional career just stop and look at, at telecommuting for instance a lot of us have done a lot of that over the the last few years with the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and it's going to continue to evolve as part of society. You know, telecommuting uh, makes child care a little easier because you don't have to be in the office from 8 to, to 4.30 or 9 to 5. Um, it allows us to work in our jammies or our hoodies or, or, or whatever, rather than having to wear business clothing for a lot of our work. It's reducing our driving. It's reducing our greenhouse footprint. It's reducing the number of miles we put on our cars. It's reducing the amount of time we spend every day behind the wheel. If you commute an hour each way, that's two hours a day that you you save. That's 8%, not 8% of your life you're saving by not having to commute. It's comfortable. Now, hopefully... You're working in a comfortable environment. Um, There's a statistic that shows that there's less crime, at least property crime, when people work from home because people aren't breaking into your house in the middle of the day while you're at work. Or your porch pirates aren't stealing the packages from your porch because you heard the uh, delivery man ring the doorbell. Um, uh, telecommuting is really great for people with disabilities. The uh, Americans with Disability Act requires us to create work environments that work for everyone. But if people are working from home, then they have the accommodations they need, hopefully. Um, and businesses have to buy less office space. We can build smaller buildings. We don't have to have all of those those monstrous buildings and everybody doesn't have to have their own office with a door. It's kind of, those are some of the benefits and there are lots of other benefits. Lots of people really like to telecommute and like to work from home. On the other hand, there's a lot of people that it doesn't work very well for. And, and I wanna, wanna list a couple of those things. A lot of individuals are finding that there's a loss of home life work balance um, because, well, you're in front of the computer all day. To work an extra hour in the evening because you've got work to do, well, I don't have to put my clothes on, I have to put my shoes on, I'll just log in and check my email, um, or oh, I'll just work on this little project here. So lots of people are finding that they're spending more time working remotely than they ever did when they were working face-to-face. And uh, getting that balance right is difficult. Um, And you're going to have to set boundaries between your work life and your home life. It's less structured. And there are a lot of people that really don't like that. A lot of people like having a structure, sitting down. For instance, I'm recording this video in my office at the university. Why? Well, because today I wanted a little bit more structure. I wanted to come to a place away from home and away from all the distractions where I could do this. Um, Less interaction. You know, all that uh, water cooler talk and seeing people walk by your office and maybe going out to lunch with your coworkers and and uh, some of that interpersonal relationship that you get in an office setting, you get less than in, in, a, in a virtual telecommuting environment. Maybe you're having a problem with supplies and equipment. Um, th- that's, that's a problem. Uh, it discriminates possibly against people with the digital divide issues that I've talked about in a previous slide. If you don't have high-speed internet, you can't work from home. And if you live out in the country, you can't work from home. Then you've got the whole idea, and, and that whole work from home versus not work from home, what about it? We're creating a, a two-tier 
or even a multi-tier workforce where some work from home, some work a hybrid and come in some days a week, some work face-to-face -face every day. How are promotions handled? How is job, um, how are raises handled? How, how do you even handle uh, all of that in a virtual, non-virtual, semi-virtual environment? It really creates a lot of ethical issues for, for business and business management. Just wanted you to think about some of those pros and cons of telecommuting. And every one of those work just as well with students taking classes online, doesn't it? So I alluded to some of this slide on some of the previous slides, but how does information technology and systems affect your health? Well, there are, are uh, several categories here, and I just want to quickly go over them. There are ergonomic health. Ergonomics is the study of how the human body works in an environment and how the human body works. So if you spend all day in front of a computer screen, you're a knowledge worker. Um, is your posture being supported by your chair? Do you have a good chair, good desk? Are everything adjusted correctly? Is it designed properly? If you're telecommuting, it's your problem, not the employer's problem. So do you have a good workspace, a good chair, a good environment? Are you hurting yourself physically? There's repetitive stress injuries. One of them is called carpal tunnel, where, where the uh, tunnel here in your wrist becomes inflamed and your hands start to go numb and you can do permanent damage to the nerves in your fingers. There's eye strain and, and lots of other health issues, direct health issues that go along with it. Um, one of the things that the book talked about in the PowerPoint slides and in the book is parental uh, inattention. You know, how much time, how hard is, okay, if you're playing on your phone, you're not really paying attention to what's going on around you. I know you can multitask. No, you can't. Um, human beings aren't very good at multitasking. You can't text and drive safely. You can't walk down the street and text safely. It just isn't going to happen. Um, so distracted walking, distracted driving, distracted parenting is, is all part of being surrounded by screens and tablets and phones and computers and laptops and work and, and all of those other kinds of things. So, so we have to, and, and the work-life balance that I talked about previously are all just a, a really a essential thing to consider. Um, I regularly unplug, um, and it, it, it helps with my sanity. I go out on the tractor or go out in the barn without a device or to go up to my uh, cabin and drum on my uh, a drum set, my old analog drum set, so that I can't hear the phone ring. And I'm not listening for the phone because that's my time. Um, and, and there is the whole concept of addiction. Addiction is, 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 is a broad category of, of conditions and diseases where you want more, um, and it becomes problematic in your life. There are, uh, sexual addictions, uh, dealing with, with the internet and some of the content that's available out there. There's gambling addictions of, of uh, their gaming addictions of people, online gaming. There are uh, even texting and sexting and, and all kinds of other um, addictions. Are you addicted to Facebook? Are you addicted to TikTok? Are you addicted to Instagram? Are you addicted to Discord or whatever? Do you get squirrely if you've been away for too long, if you don't know exactly what's going on? Maybe. Um, these are questions you're going to need to ask yourself and uh, look at your whole physical, spiritual, emotional health. Um, admit you have a problem if you find you're starting to have a problem. If your back hurts when you're sitting in front of the computer, admit you have a problem and go seek help. Um, 
if you're finding you're having problems with addiction or distractions, admit you have a problem and, and go go ask for help. There are all kinds of, of sites online that can help. There are also lots of, of professionals that can help you with this. Um, but one of the things you might need to do is to limit the use or limit the times and places that you use your technologies. And like me, find non-tech things to do. Um, turn, turn your phone off. And when I'm driving, I'll turn my phone off. That way I don't hear that text thing and think, oh, I need to look at that. No, I don't even listen. Or like say when I'm on the tractor or drumming, I don't even hear it. I don't want to hear it. I, just leave me alone. I'm doing my thing. I'll be back in an hour or two. Um, and the world doesn't stop. world keeps going. It, it's not a problem. Our book author also kind of uh, lumps green computing into being ethical and, and, and how we're thinking about um, computing. We really desperately as, as a species on this little ball of dirt we call the planet Earth um, need to be more aware of, of sustainability and how to create an environment that's going to work for us for the next centuries. Um, I hope humanity doesn't extinctify itself. Um, and what we need to do is we need to start thinking sustainably. Um, and there are really four areas of sustainability. There's the sustainability in the design phase, in the manufacturing phase, in the use phase, and then lastly, in the disposal phase of, of all materials that we use, um, how we design automobiles to be more efficient, how we use them to be more efficient. And so when we're thinking about computing, computing services, computing resources, hardware, um, and even some software, we need to think about it as we're going into the design of that equipment or, again, something. We need to design it to use less energy. We need to design it to be longer lasting. And we need to design it for some modularity and, and repair. How many of us, um, we break a phone screen, eh, phone's a year and a half old, ah, I'll just throw it away and buy a new one. So there, there we go. Uh, can you replace the laptop back? on your machine? Can you um, load a better, can you upgrade the memory on your, on your phone, tablet, PC, laptop? Um, so, so if we design things to be modular, take it apart, change the module, put it back together, we've upgraded it, then we're not replacing the whole system. We're just replacing modules or pieces of the system. So a modular design, longer lasting design, and designing to use less energy. When we manufacture, there's a huge amount of waste that comes out of manufacturing. Uh, scrap, defects, um, uh, packing material, and lots of other things. So we need to, to design our manufacturing around less waste, less energy, and fewer toxic materials toxic chemicals to create the devices we're, we're building as well as fewer toxic materials inside. And that also goes back to design. For instance, your lithium ion batteries and, and nickel cadmium batteries in, in electronic rechargeable devices, that's bad stuff for the environment. Mercury, lead, and, and uh, lots of other rare earth minerals that we need to uh, really design and manufacture and use a lot less of to be sustainable. We need to uh, use less energy. And one of the th ways we can use less energy is to turn your device off when you're not using. Um, enable the power saving modes and let the screens go black and let the hard drive shut itself off. Um, virtualization is a way that we can reduce um, energy usage. If we virtualized our servers or moved things out to the cloud, then we're burning less energy locally. Hopefully our cloud providers are uh, using sustainable practices to generate energy 
to, to run their to run their equipment. And then lastly, and this is the gorilla in the room, this is the big hard problem that we're really struggling with. How do we dispose of our tech properly? How do we dispose of our tech to maintain our privacy? How do we dispose of our tech to um, to let somebody else use it, uh, to repurpose our tech, to recycle our tech? Um, so much of tech is not degradable. It's plastic. It's toxic chemicals wrapped in plastic with wires. Um, you know, that goes into a landfill and it'll be there for thousands of years. Um, certainly not biodegradable and certainly not um, repurposed or recycled. A smartphone is an amazingly difficult thing to recycle because it's made up of multiple kinds of plastic, glass, metals, um, uh, all kinds of materials, and to take it back apart and disassemble it back into its components where the components can be used again is extremely difficult. And it's a huge ethical and moral thing that we as a society need to address. This concludes my video presentation on chapter four of, of, of our course. I hope this was helpful. Remember, uh, thank you first, and remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me at jrenault at shawnee.edu. Might be on the tractor, so but I will respond. The other thing I want you to remember is read the chapter, do your homework, pay attention to what's on Blackboard, ask questions, uh, come to office hours, and read the syllabus. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.